Thank you for joining this TCTAP's highlight session, Pharmacotherapy. Currently, we are witnessing a significant expansion of our pharmacological options after PCI. The increasing number of variables to consider, for example, the possible antiplatelet and antithrombotic combinations with variations in dosing, drug eluding stent type, and most importantly, an individual patient's underlying risk level for both thrombosis and bleeding made us develop a more reasonable and patient-centered antithrombotic pharmacotherapy following PCI. In this session, leading experts in this field will discuss the updated evidence and clinical implication of short DAP strategy, subsequent P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy after DAP, escalation and de-escalation antiplatelet strategies, and the difference in perception and practice between Westerners and East Asians regarding these strategies. Please welcome the moderators, Dr. George D. Dangis from Mount Sinai School of Medicine and Dr. David Joel Cohen from University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine in USA. Welcome everyone to the exciting TCT Asia Pacific 2020 virtual session on pharmacotherapy in relation to coronary PCI. I'm George Dangas from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York as a co-moderator of this session with David Coyne from University of Missouri, Kansas. We have a set of great discussants to be joining us. Professor Davide Capodano from Catania, Italy, Dr. Mamas Mamas from the United Kingdom, as well as Dr. Jung um, and Dr. Lee from South Korea. And we have a set of four lecturers in the subjects of PCI combination antiplatelet therapy, uh, mono antiplatelet therapy options, and other very intriguing escalation, de escalation techniques. Uh, it's going to be Dr. They're going to be Dr. Dominic Angelillo from University of Florida, Dr. Roxana Moran from Mount Sinai, Dr. Bobby Ye from Harvard Medical School, BI Deaconess Medical Center, and Dr. Park from Asan Medical Center, Ulsan University of South Korea. And at this point, let me pass on the baton to my co-moderator, Dr. David Cohen, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, uh, George. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone uh, uh, virtually across the, across the globe. So our first lecture in this uh, uh, antiplatelet ther uh, therapy session is Dominic Angelillo. Uh, from the University of Florida, who's going to be speaking on escalation and de-escalation strategy for DAPT, rationale, and evidence. It is my pleasure today to present to you over the next uh, uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, the rationale and evidence for escalation and de-escalation strategies for dual antiplatelet therapy. These are my disclosures. So, uh, the topic of escalation and de-escalation has received a lot of attention over the past years with the introduction of a, uh, a number of uh, uh, P2Y12 receptor inhibitors. And on this background, uh, a few years ago with several members on this panel, uh, we put together uh, an expert consensus on actually uh, how uh, to switch, uh, uh, why and what are the clinical implications, which I will be summarizing uh, in my presentation. Now, there are many, many ways of, of, of switching. You can switch between oral agents. Uh, you can switch between oral and intravenous and vice versa. Uh, my job today is to speak more specifically about the concept of escalation and de-escalation. So uh, what do we mean by escalation? Escalation is the switching uh, from a, a clopidogrel uh, to a more potent uh, P2Y12 uh, uh, inhibitor. And in general, uh, the uh, escalation occurs in, uh, from 5 to 50% uh, of patients, depending on the clinical uh, setting. Uh, in, general, in general, this occurs in patients presenting with an acute coronary syndrome. They uh, undergo uh, a, a PCI, and uh, they have been, for example, pretreated with clopidogrel. Or patients who come in with an ACS while on clopidogrel, what we call therapeutic failure. Now, most of the data that we have on the concept of uh, uh, escalation derived from uh, uh, subgroup analysis of clinical trials, registries, and a number of pharmacodynamic studies. 
the only true evidence, clinical evidence of escalation from a large clinical trial actually comes from the PLATO trial, where 50% of patients were actually pretreated with uh, clopidogrel. As a reminder, in Triton, uh, to me, 38 patients pretreated with clopidogrel were not eligible for randomization. So what have we learned from uh, important pharmacodynamic studies? Here you see the results of the swap. Uh, a study with Prasagrel and the response study with Ticagalor. I'm going to make a long story short. Essentially, when you need to escalate, you should use a loading dose uh, to achieve immediate platelet uh, inhibition. There have been a lot of concerns with overdosing in, in, in this concept. And I'm going to explain to you that overdosing cannot occur. Here you see this cartoon of a platelet with the P2Y12 receptors. If a patient has Prasacryl or Ticagrel on board, you have a near complete occupancy of the receptors. If on the other hand, the patient has been pretreated with clopidogrel, you can see that the a drug essentially goes to occupy the main, remaining receptors. You cannot have, uh, uh, you cannot have uh, overdosing by definition because you cannot block more receptors than those that are available. And then these drugs get uh, those drugs that are not binded get uh, eliminated. Let's go to the concept of the de-escalation. In other words, the de-escalation is going from a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor to a less potent. This is something a little bit to distinguish from the concept that uh, Dr. Moran will be speaking about a little bit later on dropping aspirin. According to consensus, de-escalation alludes to the concept of going from a more potent to a less potent uh, P2Y12 inhibitor. And even this is a phenomenon that occurs rather frequently in uh, a clinical practice. It can happen in the hospital, but uh, even more commonly after hospital uh, discharge. And the main reasons are uh, can be related to costs, to a generic clopidogrel, and the concerns about uh, a bleeding with the more potent P2Y12 inhibitors. Uh, another uh, reason uh, are the non-bleeding side effects. For example, with dyspnea, with ticagalor, it is a reason to lead many practitioners to switch to clopidogrel. Uh, and what we learned from pharmacodynamic studies is that uh, it is natural that when you de-escalate, you have an increase in uh, uh, platelet uh, reactivity. But a difference from escalation, de-escalation uh, has uh, important implications based on the pharmacology of the different agents. Now, uh, as mentioned before, it's obvious that when we de-escalate from a, a, a more potent to a less potent drug, you have an increase in platelet reactivity. This is a, an example that we have with both Ticagalor and Prasagrel. But what are the key differences between the two drugs? Now with Ticagalor, you need to keep in mind that the offset of the drug is way more rapid. So here the concept is if you start off with a maintenance dose of clopidogrel, you're gonna have where it takes at least one week to achieve the full antiplatelet effects, it's gonna take you're gonna have a number of days where the patient is not covered. Okay, so that's very important to keep in mind. Now we assess this concept in the SWAP4 study, which was a dedicated pharmacodynamic study to evaluate whether you should or should not de-escalate with a loading dose and the timing of the loading dose. And essentially, here you see a bunch of pharmacodynamic assessments. The take home message here is that uh, you always need to load with a loading dose. It really doesn't matter uh, if this is giving 12 or 24 hours after the last maintenance dose uh, of Ticagalor, uh, but it is important to always give the load. So uh, the take home <coughs> message here is when de-escalating from Ticagalor to Clopidogrel, always give a 600 milligram loading dose of Clopidogrel 12 to 24 hours after the last dose of Ticagalor in both acute and chronic phase. What do we know about Prasagrel? Well, Prasagrel is very different because as we learned from the recovery trial, it takes seven to 10 days to recover from prasagrel induced platelet inhibition. So therefore, even if you start with a maintenance dose of clopidogrel, by the seven to 10 days, you have achieved the full antiplatelet effects. Now, in our consensus, we still say that in the acute phase, it's just safe to give a loading dose. Reason being, you have higher platelet turnover rates. But once you're beyond the, the, uh, uh, the acute phase, it's okay to start off with a maintenance dose. And all these recommendations are uh, summarized in uh, this uh, cartoon uh, from our consensus on what to do in the acute phase and in the chronic phase uh, of, of, of switching uh, therapy. Let's move on a little bit to the clinical aspect of my presentation. So why did de-escalation also emerge as a strategy? 
Well, one of these has emerged as a bleeding reduction strategy, because as I mentioned before, uh, we know that with prolongation of treatment with the more potent P2I12 inhibitors, we do have an increased risk of bleeding complications. And we know that the vast majority of the benefit of the new therapies is, uh, uh, is early. So the question becomes, uh, can we de-escalate, reduce bleeding without any trade-off in ischemic events? And I'm gonna summarize here in this slide, the major findings from the clinical trials. I think here are the important uh, take home messages from a clinical perspective. Well, we've learned from the SCOPE registry, which is an observational registry performed in Italy, that if you discharge uh, uh, the patient early and you switch early, and it's not guided, what I mean by guided by uh, platelet function or genetic testing, there's an increase in ischemic recurrences with no differences in bleeding. And most of these patients were treated with Ticagra. very, very important because in the acute phase, if you are switching, for example, 24 hours after an ACS, a recent stent implantation, and for example, you're just switching to a maintenance dose of clopidogrel, you're gonna have a lot of patients who are not covered, do not have antiplatelet protection. And this is what was observed in the scope registry. Now in the topic study, which was a randomized study, they said, well, let's wait a month and switch patients to clopidogrel one month after. What the trial showed that there was reduced bleeding and there was no increase in ischemic events. Now, something to keep in mind about this study that these were overall low risk ACS patients, okay? And it was not guided. And then we have the uh, tropical ACS study where patients were uh, switched one week after an ACS. Now these were all high risk, but these were all guided. So in other words, there was a testing conducted to make sure that patient responded to clopidogrel. And the study showed no increase in ischemic events and a trend towards reduced bleeding. And this is what made the uh, European guidelines as a class 2B recommendation for this strategy. We also have the Taylor PCI uh, study, which was recently presented at the uh, ACC. Uh, this was more of an escalation study. However, it reached uh, uh, it did not reach statistical significance. There was a trend towards significance. Um, I think there were some issues with the study uh, uh, design on the approach. I will not dwell into details, but again, some signals there. And on this uh, uh, background of all these uh, uh, switching studies, we, uh, again, with many members on this panel, we put together uh, an updated consensus on how to implement uh, uh, tailored testing with platelet function genetic testing. And what we essentially say that you should follow the guidelines and in certain clinical settings, it is reasonable to consider testing uh, to uh, uh, guide uh, a de-escalation. So I would like to uh, conclude mostly on the concept of de-escalation because it's where we have the data. Uh, de-escalation commonly occurs in clinical uh, uh, practice. Uh, although routine de-escalation cannot be recommended, uh, de-escalation of P2I12 inhibitor therapy is a reasonable, uh, to, and a reasonable approach to reduce the risk of bleeding in selected patients uh, requiring dual antiplatelet therapy. My personal tips for clinical practice, avoid doing this too early, for example, within the first 30 days after an ACS. Try to identify your patients who are at higher risk of bleeding and low risk of ischemic events. I would consider a testing just to make sure that the patients are good responded to clopidogrel and use the recommended switching regimens to avoid any drug-drug interactions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so a different uh, type of de-escalation is the topic of our uh, next lecture. This will be given by Dr. Roxana Meron from uh, Mount Sinai uh, in New York. And she's going to be speaking about the very interesting topic of P2Y12 monotherapy, uh, updated evidence and clinical implications for the real world. Uh, Roxana? Thank you, David. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to be around uh, uh, with all of my colleagues and friends, uh, and especially our dear close friends uh, at TCT Asia Pacific on this uh, virtual meeting. Thank you for having me. Um, today's topic on P2Y12 monotherapy is a hot one, and some of the data comes right out of Korea that really endorses some of this, and we'll talk about how we got there. It's important for you to, dis, um, to uh, note my disclosures and specifically, as I will be speaking about the Twilight Study, which was sponsored uh, by the ICANN School of Medicine, but um, uh, funded by AstraZeneca. Um, oh, 10 years ago now, a decade ago, the PLATO trial 
really, really gave us insight into a new P2Y12 inhibitor, reversible BID dosing, and showed its superiority for reducing cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke uh, compared to clopidogrel in patients with non-ST segment elevation, um, myocardial infarction, ACS, and STEMI. And these patients, over 18,000 patients were randomized and showed this important benefit and brought ticagrelor to the market. But what was really important um, in that study is the interaction between the dosing of aspirin and ticagrelor. It, there seemed to be an important interaction in combining ticagrelor with a high dose of aspirin, which was mostly given in the United States. And you can see here this very, very important interaction that was uh, basically shown that in fact, ticagrelor with low dose aspirin was the most effective combination therapy in patients with ACS uh, for reducing uh, the important events of cardiovascular of death, myocardial infarction, and stroke. So the underlying rationale for a P2Y12 monotherapy came from there with the very early signals that if low dose is good, maybe no dose is better and going to a P2Y12 monotherapy. And we learned from the DAP study that a prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy does give you a benefit in reducing ischemic events, but there was a bleeding price to pay. So if we take P the aspirin off, can we actually give patients a longer, durable, potent P2Y12 inhibitor on board? And so this is a really, really important issue because we are having some issues with aspirin, with resistance, bleeding risk, very important gastrotoxicity with upper GI bleeds, and also this really interesting mechanistic, and it's, a, it's not really been fully proven, but there has been some data that there could be some abolishing or decreasing of the antithrombotic effect of the P2Y, uh, P2Y12 receptor blockers in vivo that's mediated by the amplification of the antiplatelet effect of the inhibitory prostaglandins like PGI2, which is uh, what we see with aspirin. And in the presence of a very strong, um, efficacious, predictable P2Y12 inhibition like Ticagrelor, aspirin really provides little benefit, but can we prove that? Well, our colleagues in, uh, in Europe really did take the very first step with global leaders trial. It was very much together, but this was the largest ever PCI study, all comers. Um, 16,000 patients randomized to an experimental arm of aspirin ticagrelor only for a month and then dropping the aspirin and moving ahead with ticagrelor monotherapy for the next 23 months versus a control arm that had multiple embedded comparisons, unfortunately, but there was um, a um, clopidogrel arm for um, stable CAD, a, a ticagrelor, a usual one-year therapy of DAPT, and then going to aspirin alone that we know that we have a class one indication for. What these investigators did is use the composite all-cause mortality and non-fatal Q-wave MI up to two years after randomization. And they were had very lofty goals to show superiority in this event. Um, uh, everything was investigator-driven uh, investigator and reported. Uh, bleeding events were not adjudicated. And of course, the Q-wave um, MI was um, adjudicated by a core lab. Well, I think this was a missed opportunity because they just missed the superiority. And to me, what you're really looking for is to make sure that the events are no different. And in fact, if you look at the experimental arm for the composite endpoint of death and Q-wave MI, 3.8 versus 4.3, they really nearly missed that um, uh, superiority uh, p-value. But everything is sort of in favor of, um, of, of the experimental arm. There was no US data, um, mostly in Europe. We had no Asian data. It was, uh, there was no adjudication. And as I said, the comparator arm had multiple embedded comparison. But to me, this is a positive study because it tells us that it's safe. It's safe uh, in terms of death MI, 
um, those two very important endpoints to withdraw aspirin. Um, investigators uh, in, in Japan did a very beautiful study with one month versus 12 months of DAPT with clopidogrel in the STOP2 DAPT trial. Here, they uh, randomized patients, and this was mostly with the Zion stent, a, a very good stent, um, one that we use all the time, looking at one month versus uh, 12 months. Um, uh, they actually showed uh, the, uh, uh, the primary endpoint, which was a composite of, of uh, pretty much um, a, a large uh, composite endpoint of death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, and bleeding, a NACE event, net adverse clinical event in favor of the one month DAP. But I caution everyone um, that what we should really look at here again is not looking for the win on the ischemic endpoints, but rather a non inferiority and no signal of harm. Because what we do know is that we will reduce bleeding. And the signal of harm is what we're looking for. These were very low event rates still underpowered to say you can go with clopidogrel monotherapy, but still a really good result. Our colleagues in, um, in Korea um, did this particular trial, the Smart Choice Study, a prospective multi-center randomized open label. This was a non-inferiority with multiple stent platforms of the kinds of stents we are using at the moment, randomizing at the clinical centers uh, with the different types of uh, P2Y12 inhibitors with the three months versus 12 months of DAPT, 3,000 patients. And here they looked for non-inferiority and they actually met the non-inferiority of death MI stroke at 12 months, showing again, no signal of harm. And here for the most part, this was with clopidogrel uh, and they did show a lowering of the bleeding events with the, um, with of course the shorter duration of DAPT but going compared to a monotherapy with a P2Y12 inhibitor. We then uh, talk about the TWILIGHT study. This was a study that was um, really looking at the kinds of patients, and it's important to note what kinds of patients. TWILIGHT is not for everyone. We did not include STEMI patients. We included patients who were uh, either stable or acute coronary syndrome patients without an ST segment elevation MI, and they needed to get in by a clinician who wanted to send the patient home on aspirin and ticagrelor with an added um, clinical or angiographic risk criteria. And we looked for these high risk criteria that would bring you in for both high bleeding as well as high ischemic risk. And take a look at this. Elderly, age greater than 65, female gender, troponin positive ACS, um, uh, patients with established PAD, diabetes, or chronic kidney disease. And on the angiographic side, we really wanted to include those patients that had some complexity of their lesion profile that would really render them uh, eligible for a potent agent for a prolonged period of time, like multivessel disease, long lesions, bifurcation lesions, left main calcific lesions. This was a prospective randomized study. I felt very, very um, compelled that this needed to be a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and many of you on the on this panel were uh, served um, and helped with this trial, with the design of this study, as well as the conduct and the execution of the trial at 187 sites in 11 countries. We had an open enrollment uh, period of aspirin and ticagrelor. At the end of three three months, everyone was evaluated in person. These patients were evaluated for ascertainment of important ischemic or bleeding events and for adherence to the dual antiplatelet therapy of ticagrelor and aspirin for the entire duration of the three months. And if they met those two criteria with no events and a good adherence, they were randomized to ticagrelor plus aspirin versus ticagrelor plus a matching placebo and then evaluated a month after the randomization, six months after randomization and then 12 months, both for adherence to the study drug as well as ascertainment of events. And then with an open period of standard of care, just uh, very similar to what the DAPT investigators did looking for a rebound effect. Here were the results. We aimed for superiority in reducing bleeding events as the primary actually efficacy endpoint, 
um, where we know if we draw this out, we should reduce bleeding. And in fact, we did by an order of 44% reduction in uh, bleeding with the numbers needed to treat of only 33 by dropping aspirin. Was this a safe practice in this patient population? Well, it seems that there's no question that in the per protocol safety analysis of looking for death, MI and stroke, we did not see a signal of harm. Does it mean that it's safe across the board? We should be doing this to everyone. It's telling you that for this types of patients, the likelihood of harm would be for, the, for these hard endpoints of death, MI and stroke would be really, really improbable. Another trial from our Korean investigators just published in the JAMA, and I want to congratulate um, these, uh, these investigators, very similarly looked at ticagrelor monotherapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with acute coronary syndromes. They included patients who received a bioresorbable polymer um, uh, with a serolimus eluding stent treated for an acute coronary syndrome, and they excluded the very high bleeding risk patients, if you needed an oral anticoagulant, if you were quite elderly, if there was a, a, a problem with hepatic function, et cetera. 3,000 patients randomized one-to-one, -one, three months versus 12 months. This was very similar to what we did, um, frankly, in, in Twilight, but they randomized at the time of PCI and then followed them all the way through up to 12 months looking for those events. Their primary endpoint, however, included a combination of bleeding events plus ischemic events, a net adverse clinical event at 12 months. And lo and behold, they showed a fantastic benefit in the Tyco trial for ticagrelor monotherapy after three months of aspirin ticagrelor uh, in patients treated uh, for ACS. And you can see here that they showed a reduction in major bleeding, and most of this was driven by bleeding, very similar to Twilight. So it was great to see sort of a trial that basically shows very, very similar uh, results than what we found in Twilight. Just most recently, and just yesterday, and I didn't have a chance a couple of days ago, there are now multiple meta-analyses looking at P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy uh, for secondary prevention. This particular one I really like because it kind of makes us think about this as a possibility compared to aspirin for secondary prevention in patients with atherosclerotic disease. This was by Giulio Stefanini and uh, Mauro Chiarito. They looked at the co-primary endpoints of myocardial infarction and stroke. And then of course, um, they looked at all of these bleeding events as well. And their idea was by looking at these trials and you can see the ones that are here, these are secondary prevention trials showing that stroke is no different that myocardial infarction is in favor of a P2Y12 monotherapy. And in fact, in all-cause mortality and vascular death does not seem to be any different. So you could actually go to this monotherapy as a possibility for secondary prevention. And maybe this is how we should be thinking about this because the overall benefit could be very, very interesting. And there was also no interaction between P2Y12 inhibitor and uh, type and the treatment effects. So it was very, very important. There's always been this question of stroke um, with, this, um, with this possibility that aspirin protects you against stroke. They looked at some of these secondary endpoints, importantly, um, uh, the safety endpoints of bleeding and especially intracranial hemorrhage seemed to be better for P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy compared to aspirin. And I think that's an important thing for us to think about uh, for our patients. So to conclude, I think um, um, we now have ample evidence. And, and just uh, two days ago, um, Michelle O'Donohue and the group at Timmy um, uh, published a, an IPD analysis that uh, looked at um, uh, and, and showed very similar results, reducing bleeding, no increase in ischemic events. And so this could be a way to go. Um, the, the, the question of a, the stroke risk um, is the one that we really will need 20 plus thousand patients. We are currently working on a patient-based meta-analysis with Marco Valdramigli between global leaders, Twilight and multiple other ones, and, and hopefully Tyco will join us. We're really, really looking forward to getting that database and looking to share that with the world.
favoring the P2Y12 monotherapy is something for us to think about and a new way to have Bobby Ye get his way of getting a prolonged uh, protection against ischemic events without increasing bleeding events. I think the golden nugget of treating patients after PCI or for any secondary prevention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Bobby Ye, who's a, a colleague and good friend from uh, Boston, who's uh, really been a leader in the field of uh, trying to uh, uh, understand heterogeneity of uh, treatment benefit and how do we choose uh, uh, the best patients for which uh, different strategy. He's gonna be speaking on uh, the short DAP strategy in contemporary PCI, uh, routine or selective. So the question I was asked was to talk about whether or not a short DAP strategy should be more uh, routine or should it be selective. Uh, and I, I'd like to start by thinking about whether or not uh, this is really the right question, because I think that if you look at the guidelines now, uh, both in the American and the European guidelines, what's clear is that a selective strategy is favored over a one size fits all approach. And I think that we would agree that this is true uh, in medicine in general. And you can see that there are class 2B recommendations here for uh, shortening DAP duration less than the default of six months for those at high bleeding risk, increasing it potentially at, at high ischemic risk patients or at low bleeding risk. And these sort of individualization guidelines are true both in the US and in Europe. And it's true both for elective and for ACS patients. So I wanted to reframe the question a little bit. <clears throat> and Roxana, Dr. Moran has already touched upon this, which is, you know, in 2020, what constitutes a short DAP strategy? Four years ago, if we were talking about this, I think we would know that short DAP meant dual antiplatelet therapy and then discontinuation to go to aspirin monotherapy. In 2020, uh, short DAP is very different. For one, six months used to be considered a short DAP strategy 10 years ago. Now, when we're talking about short DAP, we're talking about one to three month duration, I think. Uh, and we're talking about, that's for elective. And for ACS, we're really talking about, I think, between one and six months of dual antiplatelet therapy for an ACS patient, uh, less than the default of 12 months. And again, stopping DAPs now means moving to either an aspirin or a P2Y, P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy strategy. And I think the evidence is slightly different in both of those cases. So I think the relevant questions are, should the default DAP strategy, which is currently six months for elective and 12 months for ACS, be shortened? And how do I implement a selective DAP approach or DAP duration if I don't think that a routine one is the one that we should be going for. So I wanted to talk about some of the data uh, that support the use of shorter DAP duration. And many of these are not randomized trials of DAP duration themselves, but either registries or trials comparing stents. And the first one I want to talk about is the Onyx-1 uh, global study, which took uh, high bleeding risk patients undergoing PCI for an assortment of indication and randomized them to the Onyx, uh, Onyx drug eluting stent compared to the BioFreedom. And if people recall, the BioFreedom had beaten bare metal stents in an HBR population in the leaders free trial. And so this was a comparison. BioFreedom had become the gold standard for HBR patients. Onyx now was compared to BioFreedom uh, in a non inferior design with only one month of dual antiplatelet therapy. It's important to note that dual that single antiplatelet therapy here meant moving in some cases to patients to patients to P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy and others to aspirin monotherapy. But you can see that for the most part, patients really did discontinue DAPT at one month in time. And these were patients who were uh, relatively high ischemic was also included patients with ST elevation. Am I similar to leaders free had? And you can see here that despite the very short duration of DAPT, that the Onyx uh, uh, drug eluting stent uh, was really non-inferior, and I'm showing you the one-month landmark analyses where the DAP durations had, 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 were DAP to discontinued at one month. And you can see that the stent thrombosis rate, something that we're all concerned about, less than 1% for the Onyx ZES, similar to BioFreedom. And the MI rates uh, were relatively low uh, as well, although there was a high periprocedural MI rate that's probably likely due to the definition used in the trial. Uh, similarly, uh, the Evolve short DAP study was a study that was a single arm study, uh, short duration, three months of DAP in high bleeding risk patients comparing this, uh, looking at the Synergy uh, drug eluting stent. And this trial, which compared to historical controls, showed that compared to a historical control of 12 month duration of DAP, that those who received three months really did not have any evidence of harm in this population for death MI, easily meeting the nine inferiority criteria that was established. In addition, there was a performance goal set at 1% for stent thrombosis 
for three months of DAPT. And again, very, very low rates of stent thrombosis for the Synergy DES in this study uh, in this HBR population. Dr. Mern's already shown you the stopped DAP2 uh, data, but I'm going to show you this in a different context, which is just to show you that uh, the Zion's everolimus eluting stent has also been associated with very low rates of stent thrombosis, despite uh, one month, this case of one month of DAP, then going to clopidogrel monotherapy, but nevertheless, in this population in Japan, a very low rate of stent thrombosis, and we'll know ongoing information as we get publication of the Zion's uh, 90 and Zion's 28 studies for the safety of this stent. But overall, I think all of those studies are show, suggesting to us that modern, next gen, new generation drug eluting stents are each very effective uh, at, at lowering the rates of stent thrombosis compared to stent generations in the past. And we should feel comfortable that stent related events, I think, are not going to go up dramatically uh, with short duration of DAPT. But when can go too short? And I think the, the, the population where you can go too short is in particular the high-risk ACS population. Here's one uh, trial uh, from SmartDate, our Korean colleagues. Six versus 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy after ACS in 2,700 patients. And although this trial met non-inferiority, the conclusion of the trial was that the authors felt it was still not uh, comfortable to necessarily shorten duration, at least in this type of population, because there was this signal of an increase in myocardial infarction. And maybe this shouldn't be entirely surprising, because in the DAP study, not only did we not compare a very short duration to sort of a standard 12 months, but it appeared that ACS patients were particularly the ones who benefited from very long duration, so 30 months of DAP. ACS in particular had, had, had larger absolute risk reductions uh, in stent thrombosis-related MI, but also in non-stent thrombosis-related MI. So although the benefits of new generation stents have reduced probably the risk of stent thrombosis that you see here, the rates of non-stent thrombosis related on might probably remain, and they probably remain in lockstep with the background uh, ischemic risk of the patient. So should our default durations be changed? I think there's growing evidence that short DAP durations result in few stent-related events with modern DES. There's no evidence that one to three months of DAP followed by aspirin monotherapy is better than the current six-month default in stable CAD even among HBR patients. That's not the trials that we've had evaluating. The exception, of course, and I'm not going to talk about, is the anticoagulated patients, where I think we have robust evidence that short duration dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, discontinuing the aspirin early, is the beneficial approach. Suggestion that the shorter duration followed by aspirin monotherapy is harmful compared to the current 12-month standard for some high-risk bleeding populations. And there's older data which show benefits for greater than 12-month duration for ACS patients who have not had bleeding within the first year. And I think we will get an evaluation, a, ran, a really uh, powerful randomized evaluation of whether or not a shorter DAP duration should become the default, at least for HBR patients with the master DAP study. And as uh, Dr. Valjamigli couldn't be here today, I'd uh, like to represent uh, his ongoing uh, trial. Actually, it's completed enrollment, I believe. So how do I implement a selective strategy? If I'm saying that I don't think that one should implement a routine strategy, how do I implement a selective strategy? Well, I think the first plus question to ask is, is my patient at high bleeding risk? And then limit very short durations to these patients who are at high bleeding risk. And I think you can use a number of, of criteria and scores. You see here the Paris bleeding risk score, the precise DAP score, as well as the HBR criteria uh, that Dr. Capadano has led, Paris bleeding uh, score that Dr. Moran has led. So each of these, I think, are useful tools to identify high bleeding risk. Each of these have been validated in various forms and methods to identify truly high bleeding risk patients. And I suggest that we use these tools when we can. Uh, but it's important that assessing bleeding risk is not enough, in my opinion. So here's an example that uh, the precise DAP score clearly on the left-hand side identifies patients at high bleeding risk, but those high bleeding risk patients also are exactly the same ones who are at high ischemic risk with higher rates of cardiac death, higher rates of target vessel MI, and higher rates of stent thrombosis for those patients with high precise DAP scores. So how do you deal with that type of thing? Well. Among HBR patients, are there some who are at high ischemic risk? Well, I show you here, I couldn't go through a lecture without talk, telling you about the DAP score again. So it's not a bleeding risk score, but it's a treatment benefit versus harm score. And this is an off-label discussion, so to speak, because the DAP study was not, DAP score was not validated in an HBR population, but it has been validated in 90,000 plus patients in nine different populations, including several all-comer studies. And that, those would be the Sweetheart study and the ADAPT-DES. And in each of those studies, 
the ischemic risk of high DAP score patients, it's not rocket science, these are just traditional ischemic risk factors, the ischemic risk for stent thrombosis and MI is, is significantly higher. It's about 60% higher for a high DAP score patient than a low, and these patients tended to have lower bleeding risk, 20% lower bleeding risk as well. So additional considerations for a selective strategy. You know, we've talked a lot about the patient, but what happened during the procedure? And so I think if that you're an interventional cardiologist, the onus is on you to perform procedures in high risk, bleed, high bleeding risk patients with state of the art techniques that include intravascular imaging, vessel preparation for optimal expansion, high pressure post dilation and post stent imaging. And if you're a referring cardiologist and you're receiving your patient back and they say, and you're thinking about whether or not there should be a, a short DAP duration, you should know whether or not these things were performed and you should be sending your patients honestly selectively to the, to the operators who are doing this type of meticulous work. So in conclusion, I think the cliche holds true that there is no one size fits all for DAP strategies. And the caveat, and I think Dr. Moran just raised it in her lecture, is that it is looking like the P2Y12 monotherapy strategy may prove to be a really optimal middle ground for a large swath of patients. Uh, but until then, at, when I, my lecture is really focused on asp, discontinuing DAP to aspirin monotherapy. Shortening duration and stable PCI likely does not meaningfully increase ischemic events uh, nor does it necessarily increase bleeding events in very low uh, patients, although, so the higher, the greater the benefit, uh, uh, the greater the risk the patients are, the greater the benefit, which is why I think identifying HBR patients is particularly useful in this case, and there are tools to do so. But consider that some HBR patients may still likely benefit from a bit of a longer duration, particularly those at high ischemic risk. Thanks very much. So our final lecture th uh, this morning, before we get into the discussion, uh, is going to be given by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, D.W. Park from uh, uh, Asa Medical Center, who's going to be speaking about uh, an interesting topic of the East Asian paradox for antithrombotics, theory, evidence, uh, and next strategy. Uh, D.W. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. So uh, today my topic uh, is about the East Asian paradox for antithrombotics and theory and evidence and next uh, uh, strategy. This is uh, my disclosure. So uh, they're looking at contemporary P2I12 inhibitor in HCS or P2, PCI and uh, P2I12 inhibitor clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelator, three drugs are most commonly used. Looking at the current P2I12 guideline in HCS and PCI, current uh, European US guideline recommend the use of a potent P2I12 inhibitor, ticagrelator or prasugrel in preference to clopidogrel is reasonable for HCS. However, this recommendation is not unconditionally acceptable for East Asian, given several studies shows the East Asian population had a differential ischemic and breathing propensity compared to Western population. This is called East Asian the, uh, paradox. The East Asian paradox is definitely a challenge for antithrombotic strategy. One size does not fit all, one guideline does not fit all races. So East Asian paradox, this is a dotted line for Asian population. Breathing risk is much higher. Ischemic risk was uh, much lower compared to Western population. So sort of between window, light to shift. This is concept of East Asian paradox. Unique picture of East Asian population regarding ischemic and breathing tendency compared to Western, hemologic strong much higher, GI breathing much higher, by contrast, ischemic event much lower compared to Western population. Also, there is a, the remarkable decou decoupling, pharmacogenetic and PKPD and clinical presentation. Asian population had high prevalence CYP2, C19, loss of function genotype compared to white population was 70% versus 30%. PKPD study shows a uh, 2C19 ROF attenuate the response to clopidogrel. However, despite high prevalence of the uh, ROF and the several study reported a relatively low ischemic event in HCS or PCI among East Asian compared to Western population. This is definitely decoupling theory and clinical evidence. There are many mechanisms of the proposed mechanism of East Asian paradox, small body size, low BMI, relatively low renal clearance. Also, there is some genetic difference, polymorphism, plasma hemostatic factor, endothelial activation marker suggests the proposed mechanism. Also, update the pharmacogenomics for East Asian paradox. There was differential in the ethnic pharmacogenomic variant according to different P2I12 inhibitor. 
Looking at clinical evidence, contemporary P2I12 inhibitor in East Asian population. This is a flaccid HDS trial. This is a pivotal for prosecutor used in Japan. Compared to Triton TM38 trial, prospect HDS trial just used one third of those prosecutor 20 milligram loading dose, 3.75 milligram maintenance dose shows the similar degree of the benefit for ischemic primary endpoint. Regarding the breathing event and this reduced dose, much or less breathing event compared to standard clopidogrel, the reason why uh, the low dose prosecutor was uh, approved for Japan. So PILO trial is tested the ticagrelor standard dose in Japan and Asia, and the compared to clopidogrel, ticagrelor standard dose associate major bleeding, minor bleeding, also composite major or minor bleeding. One of the interesting things is ischemic event, composite cardiovascular death and my stroke, composite all-cause death and my stroke tend to be higher in t letter group. IPD meta-analysis seven random trial. This is the East Asian paradox clinical presentation that's evident compared to the non-East Asian black line, East Asian red line, less ischemic event, higher bleeding event, Looking at the propensity, differential breeding and ischemic tendency, East Asian breeding probability much higher, Western population ischemic probability much higher. And uh, so, and global trial and local one, and uh, compared to global dose, uh, East Asian people, sometimes different dose, ticlopidine used much lower dose, looking at the prosquerel, just one third reduced dose, Clopidogrel, ticagrelor, still same dose, however, prescription rate still limited for ticagrelor in East Asian. How to do East Asian paradox? Different dosing and strategies require East Asian population. Definitely all hypotheses should be confirmed through random trial. We performed several random trial to guide the antithrombotic in East Asian paradox. Appear, uh, the experience of a very catastrophic case early use of ticagrelor in our country, and we tested the PKPD study in targeting ACS patient. This is double blind trial, low dose ticagrelor 60 milligram, standard dose ticagrelor, standard dose clopidogrel. Primary endpoint was P2 Y12 PRU value compared to clopidogrel, much potent platelet inhibition. The interesting ticagrelor 60 milligram showed a similar degree platelet inhibition compared to ticagrelor 9 milligram. This is also similar in P2 Y12 percent inhibition. Also, Taika Korea trial, this is a, a practical trial targeting Korean population and the open level random trial one to one. Taika Galera standards those, Clopidogrel standards those 400 versus 400. The number of uh, patients is limited. Uh, primary safety endpoint defined plateau major and minor bleeding. Taika Galera associated two times higher clinically significant bleeding. The looking at the safety endpoint, each point, uh, clinical significant bleeding, major bleeding, minor bleeding, mm -hmm. even fatal bleeding, statistically significantly higher use of the standards to ticagrelor. And the secondary efficacy endpoint, uh, interestingly, very similar to the filler trial, the cardiovascular death, MI stroke, tend to be higher after use ticagrelor than clopidogrel use. Also, in the, this is TICO trial, is a uh, Roxana Meran is mentioned before, and uh, this is uh, targeting for ACS population. It's a uh, ticagrelor monotherapy uh, after three months, and the uh, one arm is a uh, uh, ticagrelor uh, 12 months. Uh, this is a uh, trial like uh, very similar trial design, and as shown the previous slide, and the net clinical benefit was much better ticagrelor monotherapy group. And the uh, three months random analysis shows the this benefit and the major bleeding is much lower in the three months the ticagrelor monotherapy group and the uh, uh, major adverse ischemic event is uh, tend to be lower in ticagrelor monotherapy group. And I'm I'm gonna introduce my, our the ongoing trial. This is a tailored chip trial and the targeting complex high risk PCI chip patient looking at the ischemic versus bleeding balancing over time in high risk patient. 
usually uh, initial time ischemic event was much higher. So we targeting more potent strategy for ischemic risk. We prescribed low dose ticagrelator 60 milligram plus aspirin after six months is a, a less potent strategy for bleeding risk, clopidogrel alone strategy. So targeting the, uh, our tailored CHIP trial, complex high-risk PCI defined leptomain, CTO, bifurcation two standing, long-standing, severe calcification, diabetic patient, re-randomization conventional depth arm versus tailored arm, early escalation, low dose ticagrelor plus aspirin, late six months part, late de-escalation clopidogrel monotherapy. So summary, the East Asian paradox described the differential ischemic and bleeding tendency to antithrombotic agent East Asian population compared to Western population. The optimal antithrombotic therapy for East Asian population should be balancing act between less ischemic and more bleeding risk. For the dose finding study may reveal the best balanced dose of a more potent P2I12 inhibitor in East Asian patients may not be the same as the global one. This is a race tailored antithrombotic strategy. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so let me um, bring back our, my co-moderator, uh, George Dangus, uh, to help me with uh, leading the uh, discussion section uh, uh, for the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. So George. Thank you, uh, uh, David. And uh, this was a fascinating session. Congratulations to uh, the four presenters for staying on time and for bringing up such controversial points. Uh, let me just bring us back maybe uh, into the first topic. So, uh, you know, if we start discussing the last, we're never going to go back to the first. Let's uh, refresh <laughs> what uh, Dominic told us. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we tried for many years to uh, many studies to uh, prove that the escalation was beneficial. And in my mind, we never really did that in a high-risk patient, in acute uh, STEMI shocks, this and that. So this study really didn't go anywhere. So at the end of the day, when you try to monitor the antiplatelets and all that, low-risk patients are studied. So naturally, de-escalation has a greater chance because if we're only enrolling low-risk patients, hey, de-escalation, that's a domain that it may be proven, may be proven right. Uh, and going back to the core of what these dual antiplatelets and all the antiplatelets do, they really prevent some acute stem thrombosis, how everything all started. So is this a one-month phenomenon, it, or at least driven mainly by this one month? Uh, uh, Dominic, are we moving towards, a, I don't know, shorter and shorter options for de-escalation and uh, guided de-escalation? Should it be the way? Yeah, so so great comments. And, and indeed, I would say that the trials that we started, we initiated 10 years ago, uh, we got everything wrong. Uh, but it's also true that, uh, you know, it was an evolving field. We did not know much. Uh, we did, in some cases, we didn't have the newer agents. We didn't know the cutoffs. There was just a lot going wrong. So yes, de-escalation makes a lot of sense. And thanks to these de-escalation de studies, uh, in parallel, we had the studies of uh, dropping aspirin, and which clearly indicates that uh, we do not need to be as aggressive, uh, one, and two, perhaps we need just what works. And so if you were to ask me how, how short should we go, I think that you know, with the one to three months, now I don't know where the best cutoff is, but global leaders said you can stop at one month and not have any safety concerns. Um, I, I think we're narrowing down the, 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 the time frame. I think it, then the next step is, which is the best drug for the individual patient? Uh, you know, with the, w we showed in, in, in Twilight, you know, with Ticagrel, you know that the drug is going to work. With uh, Clopidogrel, uh, not always. And so that's where the concept of, tail, of, of, of testing uh uh, come comes in. We recently introduced a score. It's called ABCD gene scores because it's not all about the genes. Uh, it's also about clinical factors. So it's a very, very simple score that we put together with uh, Davide Cabodano where uh, you can use these clinical and genetic factors to identify and predict response. This is my take. Davide, you want to you wanna give us your take and, and maybe see how you practice and maybe then Dr. Mama's right up to tell us what, how he does things in the UK? Just very briefly about that. 
Absolutely. So I find the data robust and convincing. So uh, the two meta-analysis that Roxana has shown now are the two pieces of the puzzle that really complete it, because they show essentially that uh, it is safe to uh, re reduce uh, the antithrombotic intensity. And maybe it's also effective because in the meta-analysis of Michelle O'Donoghue, there is also a trend towards a reduction in maize. So it's not just safe, it's also more effective somehow. And what drugs to keep, uh, probably it's the same to keep the aspirin and the PTY12 inhibitors according to the meta-analysis in Lancet by Stefanini. So my next question is actually how to convince people to do that, because now we do not have the backup of guidelines uh, still, and there is this kind of clinical inertia that makes doctors continue what they have been practicing for years and years. So this is the next challenge, to uh, convince people that we have data enough in order to try this strategy, starting from eye bleeding with patients and then probably uh, going beyond. But it takes time. Dr. Lamas? Yes, in the United Kingdom, we generally don't de-escalate unless there's a clinical reason such as a bleed. Um, in terms of escalation, um, we escalate, but again, um, because of a clinical situation, so a stent thrombosis or a further ischemic event. Um, so it, it's not widely practiced in the United Kingdom. I think partly because a lot of our follow-ups are from primary care physicians rather than in secondary or tertiary care. Yeah, well, well, what's your reaction from, uh, 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 from uh, the Asian reaction from Korea, Dr. Lee and then Dr. Jung? Yeah, uh, I think um, we are witnessing a big trend of a wise use of antiplatelets, both uh, among the Westerners and East Asians, which is the short DAT and P2I 12 uh, monotherapy, particular value for HBR patients. But maybe there is a difference in the perception of which P2I 12 inhibitors to select. And I think these differences are reflected in uh, the trial designs in that clopidogrel only of dominant strategy was selected by the Asians whereas ticagrelor monotherapy was selected by the Westerners, you know. So we know that the population were different among trials, but yet ticagrelor monotherapy strategies is and will be for some time not actively accepted by the East Asians, I think. So uh, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Angel Lilo mentioned uh, a little bit ago, uh, uh, I, I, I just have the question that um, what about the situation in the U.S. because of the fundamental difference of ischemic and bleeding risk between Asians and Westerners? Uh, do, we, uh, do you think that uh, clopidogrel monotherapy is somewhat weak or do you think that it is or will be valued among, also among Westerners? Uh, that, that's a question for uh, mine. So. Yeah, so, so to answer your question, I, I, I do believe uh, that uh, in, in our population, uh, and we've shown it in a number of studies, uh, clopidogrel uh, is not associated with sustained uh, platelet inhibition in, in, in many patients. Uh, we have a very large uh, uh, number of patients with diabetes, chronic kidney disease. These are all uh, predictors associated with it with impaired response. And this is the reason why a lot of the data, for example, coming from Asian countries on P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy, uh, where a lot of clopidogrel is used, I don't think can be necessarily applied uh, to US populations. Like um, I mean, I think you make really good points that, uh, and especially from uh, Daku's uh, uh, talk, that uh, you know the the propensity for bleeding in the Asian population is tremendous. But we also have to think about this in the context of a high-risk patient with an acute coronary syndrome, specifically in Asia. And we saw now from Tycho, uh, as well as in the over a thousand patients who were randomized in China uh, in twilight in a double-blind placebo-controlled fashion, that there was a benefit in actually reducing both bleeding complications and sustaining the ischemic benefit. In a, and, and, and actually, very interestingly, in China, uh, in twilight, a large majority of the patients who went home on aspirin and ticagrelor were in fact acute coronary syndrome patients. So I think you have to really think about this in the context of the patient's presentation, their risk of recurrent ischemic events and the superiority of these potent agents against clopidogrel. And, and I really truly believe that in that type of a setting for non-stent related complications and reducing of myocardial infarction that perhaps uh, we, would, we would be thinking about a 
potent agent for as a monotherapy over clopidogrel. So I'd love to see that randomized study. And it seems like um, you guys are taking that on in complex lesions, but I would go after ACS and see if you actually are gaining the benefit. Dr. Jong, are you, uh, is a, I know that the, the, the doses are, are very different uh, uh, sometimes in, uh, in, in East Asia. Uh, are you experimenting with perhaps once a day tachagrelor or very low doses uh, of, of PTY12 inhibitors in, uh, in your patient population? Uh, actually, I, I introduced the concept of East Asian paradox uh, in uh, 2012. Just before the uh, the uh, use of the tackle or the pressure, uh, why? Uh, just based on the pharmacodynamic uh, study, uh, pharmac uh, East Asian have shown the uh, increase of uh, con blood concentrations during same dose of tackle and the pressure. So, and then the ischemic risk is somewhat lower in East Asian, during this case is somewhat higher in uh, East Asia. Taken together. So we didn't think about the uh, optimal uh, dose of tachycardia the practical to East Asia must be different with the uh, uh, Western population. This is the bottom line. And then uh, in Korea, uh, now 90 milligram uh, uh, tachycardia twice daily dose is uh, uh, possibly introduced. However, if you look at the adherence rate uh, uh, with standard tachycardia, uh, after one year, less than 50% they uh, maintenance the standard of the tackle uh, because uh, there are uh, so many concerns uh, related to the dyspnea and the minor bleeding episodes. So uh, we need to find some optimal uh, dose of uh, practical and tackle for East Asian population. George, if it's okay, I would, I would like to ask a, a, a question to uh, each of the uh, speakers um, uh, just to try to help uh, bring this back together because we've heard a lot of you know a lot of information and a lot of it is about this idea of uh, you know going to single antiplatelet therapy. Uh, David Capadano uh, said he's pretty convinced that it, at this point. So my question to all of the uh, speakers is: Can we do this? In most of the data, to my to my eye, most of the data that's not been done in Asia um, are with ticagrelor as the monotherapy. Uh, can we do it with any other agent? Can we go to three you know three months of DAPT? Uh, and, uh, and then single uh, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor with clopidogrel or prasugrel safely in a Western population yet. Are we ready? Are we ready for that? So let me take each of the, the speakers uh, in, in turn and we'll, uh, maybe we'll go backwards uh, in time. Uh, uh, just to start with uh, DW, then to uh, Bobby and then Roxana and Dominic, uh, to take that on. Okay, got it. So I think uh, uh, regarding to uh, P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy and the smart uh, choice and the uh, stop depth trial is uh, one of a uh, very representative trial in the, you know, just uh, one month and uh, three months uh, stop the aspirin, just to use clopidogrel P2I12 monotherapy. Some physician is a critic. So, you know, some in Asia population, 2019 LOF too much higher. How can you guarantee p 29 you know, clopidogrel monotherapy is a protector, you know, ischemic event. But in the real world, in the stop depth trial, in the smart choice trial, really include in the all coma patient. Uh, but the reality is the p 2 trial inhibitor is a, you know, clopidogrel is good. Also in the, our uh, center experience, we did a lot of left main cases, just uh, our usual practice is not confirm the random trial, left main complex standing after one year, we just, uh, uh, you know, maintenance uh, clopidogrel monotherapy, but this patient is usually okay. But uh, however, we definitely require much, much larger, you know, some tailored clinical trial. Great. Uh, Bobby? Yeah, you know, I, I think that that whether or not the applicability for the, the U.S., I think that the Twilight study, you know, I, I think that's a very applicable, obviously, a, a study to a U.S. population that's high ischemic risk and combination of high ischemic and bleeding risk. Um, you know, as far as going to clopidogrel monotherapy, I, I personally don't feel sufficiently comfortable that you can apply some of that data to a U.S. population. Uh, and if we were to go to that strategy, I would do it under a situation sort of like that Dominic was recommending, where you would want to confirm that the patient was responsive to clopidogrel monotherapy after you did that or before you did that would be. 
you know, I think that the sort of there's this broader question, which is, you know, do we need to change the language where we talk about this? I think when you talk to a, an outpatient doc and they ask you, how long do you want to do DAPT? In their minds, what they're asking you is, how long do you want to do the P2Y12 inhibitor? And, and, and when they ask, and, and maybe the conversation should be like, how long do you want to do, you know, when do you want to discontinue the aspirin as opposed to when do you want to discontinue the P2Y12 inhibitor? Even, the, even as I was preparing my talk, this question about short DAPT, I didn't even know how to sort of frame that because short DAPT can mean so many different things right now. Uh, and, and so it gets back to, are we a sort of, do we need to change the language with which we talk about this? That's great. That's a great point. So, uh, Roxana, what what do you think? Uh, obviously, you have a yeah. big trial with Ticagrelor, but can we do this with any other agents? I mean, I, I think what uh, Bobby uh, speaks of very, very important points um, that um, perhaps, you know, unless I've known that the patient is, especially if you're doing a very short duration of that uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with one month and then going to clopidogrel monotherapy in a patient for example, that you put a left main stent in, I'd be very nervous about that, even if I'm in Asia, even though I'm worried about it. So I would be, uh, regarding clopidogrel, I would be very nervous. And, and just as Dominic uh, discussed, it, it's, it's very, very important. It's also, I hate to say this, but I really believe that if you're going to do a withdrawal therapy or a change in and evaluate these things, it has to be done in a blinded fashion. Aspirin is widely available, and we just don't know the adherence uh, of the patients to the exact. So I wouldn't be so, wow, we won in, and we can just do clopidogrel monotherapy. I'd be very, very nervous. I think the, the trial, and I hate to say this, um, but I think I feel very confident with Twilight in patients who've tolerated three months of aspirin and ticagrelor with no ischemic and bleeding events, you can now at that time evaluate them and give them ticagrelor monotherapy for the next 12 months and you will not be harming them and you will be protecting them against ischemic complications. So that's all that we can say, I think, definitively. Beyond that, everything else is supportive but is to me needs to be evaluated in a much larger prospective trial, and I'd love to design some with you guys. So I think we should really design the real definitive study to say, when can we just de-escalate from ticagrelor to clopidogrel? Uh, is it, you know, in ACS patients, for example, so to protect them, is it right to do that? Can we um, do that? And I think we have to really do this in a really good way prospectively. So let me ask Dominic then as the expert in all the pharmacodynamics, um, you know, if we did want to, to uh, you know, if the patient was on dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel, um, and we want to stop, you know, stop the aspirin at three months or a month, um, what's the best, what would you recommend for testing? How would you test to make sure that that's working? Yeah, so the problem with testing in these situations is, um, you know, the patient needs to be on the drug uh, to assess response, which is one of the problem with pharmacodynamic testing. Um, and sometimes it may be a little bit too late. Now, all the tests that are out there are, are good. Okay, I would recommend Verify Now because anybody can do it, even an interventional cardiologist. The advantage of, of genetic testing that you can predict the response, particularly if you integrate it with clinical factors. So that's, that's, that's my, my take, and that's the reason why we introduced this score. But one thing that I just want to add, I agree with everything that's been said. I just want to add one final comment when it comes to going switching to a clopidogrel monotherapy strategy. Even if the patient responds, keep in mind that a key difference between prasco and ticagrelor, which are the potent agents, versus clopidogrel is that with aspirin and, clop and clopidogrel, there is a synergism in effect. So it's not just a matter of the effect of clopidogrel in itself, but it's the synergism with aspirin. With the potent agents, there, we don't see that synergism. The potent agents take care of business on their own. Uh, that's a, a simple way of putting it. And we've seen this with studies of stopping aspirin uh, in different clinical settings, uh, in different pharmacodynamic studies. And I think this concept uh, is not always appreciated. Great. Well, let me give it back to uh, Dr. Dangus to uh, uh, finish up and take us uh, take us home. <laughs>
Well, uh, as this was a fascinating discussion, I would like to uh, to know if any of the uh, any of the discussions has any reaction. Uh, please, uh, please go ahead uh, and our final, uh, very brief one. Uh, uh, we have uh, David of Mamas. Uh, David, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Very brief point. Very brief. The next step is uh, asset which is a trial of 200 patients, a single arm, but fascinating concept to go uh, and follow what uh, David Cohen has said. Uh, Prasugar only since the very beginning after periprocedural aspirin. Of course, it's not randomized, it's just a proof of concept, but they didn't find any single thrombosis in over one year with this strategy. So next step probably is a randomized trial as well. That's good, Dr. Mamas. Yes, from my perspective, we often think about stent-related events, but don't forget that most of the cardiovascular events uh, following an ACS are from non-stent um, lesions, over 50% from the PROSPECT trial. Um, the other consideration is that we often talk about trying to identify high bleeding risk patients, but let's not forget 80% of high bleeding risk patients also have high ischemic risk. So I think I'm more um, with Bobby's sort of concept of really personalizing our approach, thinking about bleeding, but also trying to think about the complexity of the PCI and importantly, the complexity of the patient. Dr. Jung uh, uh, or Dr. Lee from Korea, have a small reaction. Uh, as an inventor of the oestrogen uh, paradox, I really want to find how to uh, uh, explain the low risk of ischemic event. Uh, uh, Dr. said uh, different in China, but I uh, strongly believe the ischemic risk in East Asia must be lower. Why? Because their blood is not sticky, because of the uh, thrombogenicity. So the thrombogenicity may include uh, the inflammation and the coagulation pathway and the uh, fibrinolytic activity together. If you look at all together, uh, compared with the uh, uh, Western and uh, African American patients, uh, East Asian, they show so low level of inflammation and the low level of quality activity, somewhat increased uh, level of uh, people like the activity. So uh, if we take them together, we, you can think uh, we can uh, show the, some uh, the complementative evidence uh, to uh, support the low ischemic risk in East Asia and try to find this, how can it explain? The, the distinguished uh, the Western doctors. Yeah, great. And uh, um, to, um, I, I guess Dr. Lee is uh, um, yeah. going to have a final. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, um, I, uh, I think the next step for East Asian researchers is to find the optimal dose of the potent P2I12 inhibitors for ACS patients, because according to the optimal trial, even Ticagra 6 millimeter was too much, uh, at least for the pharmacodynamics for, uh, for East Asia. So uh, these potent uh, P2I12 inhibitors are valid, but not uh, at the current standard dose. It's, 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 it's very def uh, definite in East Asia. So that's, that, that is the next step for the East Asian um, uh, researchers, I think. Great, and sounds like the next step is uh, we're going to ask uh, TCP Asia Pacific to give us two hours next year. This has been an incredible <laughs> session. Uh, East East West paradoxes, uh, transcontinental <laughs> panel, and many discussions in many continents. But a great session. I'd like to thank uh, the entire faculty, uh, uh, the both lecturers, and all the discussants. And obviously, the co moderator, my co moderator, Dr. David Cohen, and all the uh, organizers of TCT Asia Pacific for allowing us to make this uh, great uh, contribution. And we look forward to an in person meeting 2021. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.